I've just started recording. So let's get into it, shall we? Here we go. Cooperation. In the theory of anti-dialogical action, conquest, as its primary characteristic, involves a subject who conquers another person and transforms her or him into a thing. In the dialogical theory of action, subjects meet in cooperation in order to transform the world. The anti-dialogical dominating I transforms the dominated conquered thou into a mere it. Note 43, see Martin Buber, I and thou. The dialogical I, however, knows that it is precisely the thou, not I, which has called forth his or her own existence. He also knows that the thou, which calls forth his own existence in turn, constitutes an I, which has in his I its thou. The I and the thou thus become, in the dialectic of these relationships, two thous which become two I's. Yes, there will be a recording on the Reading with Elliot channel. Over here, it will be posted. The dialogical theory of action does not involve a subject who dominates by virtue of conquest and a dominated object. Instead, there are subjects who meet to name the world in order to transform it. And this is a key part of learning, right? We have to name things in order to understand them and then in order to transform them. And we recognize at the same time that our naming those things is not the end of their understanding, of their completion, but merely a process, a part of the process, so that we can get to the part where we can dialogue with those names and consider, for instance, whether those names are fitting, but also what constitutes things that have that name, how to change them, what parts to change, what parts to keep, etc. If at a certain historical moment the oppressed, for the reasons previously described, are unable to fulfill their vocation as subjects, the posing of their very oppression as a problem, which always involves some form of action, will help them achieve this vocation. So again, we have the concept of problem-posing education, and that's crucial to this book. That is one of the big takeaways. How do we educate? Not by banking education, not by banking ideas into people, like they're receptacles that can just hold ideas we throw into them, but by posing problems, understanding their world, understanding their themes of their world and their understandings, and then posing problems to them, which in essence means a lot of different things, but essentially giving them problems to think about and solve that are based on their own interests and that are not just forcing them to get the answer that you want them to get, but that are in fact to help all of you understand along with them, along with yourself, better what's to do about that problem. And if you happen to be right, then that's because of the process and not because of you just having the right thing and making people think it, you know? The above does not mean that in the dialogical task there is no role for revolutionary leadership. It means merely that the leaders, in spite of their important, fundamental, and indispensable role, do not own the people and have no right to steer the people blindly towards their salvation. Such a salvation would be a mere gift from the leaders to the people, a breaking of the dialogical bond between them and a reducing of the people from co-authors of liberating action into the objects of this action. Cooperation, as a characteristic of dialogical action, which occurs only among subjects, who may, however, have diverse levels of functions and thus of responsibility, can only be achieved through communication. Dialogue, as essential communication, must underlie any cooperation. In the theory of dialogical action, there is no place for conquering the people on behalf of the revolutionary cause, but only for gaining their adherence. Dialogue does not impose, does not manipulate, does not domesticate, does not sloganize. 
This does not mean, however, that the theory of dialogical action leads nowhere, nor does it mean that the dialogical human does not have a clear idea of what she wants or of the objectives to which she is committed. The commitment of the revolutionary leaders to the oppressed is at the same time a commitment to freedom. And because of that commitment, the leaders cannot attempt to conquer the oppressed, but must achieve their adherence to liberation. Conquered adherence is not adherence. It is adhesion of the vanquished to the conqueror, who prescribes the options open to the former. Authentic adherence is the free coincidence of choices. It cannot occur apart from communication among people mediated by reality. Thus, cooperation leads dialogical subjects to focus their attention on the reality which mediates them and which, posed as a problem, challenges them. The response to that challenge is the action of dialogical subjects upon reality in order to transform it. Let me re-emphasize that posing reality as a problem does not mean sloganizing. It means critical analysis of a problematic reality. As opposed to the mythicizing practices of the dominant elites, dialogical theory requires that the world be unveiled. No one can, however, unveil the world for another. Although one subject may initiate the unveiling on behalf of others, the others must also become subjects of this act. The adherence of the people is made possible by this unveiling of the world and of themselves in authentic praxis. That's in authentic praxis, not inauthentic praxis. This adherence coincides with the trust the people begin to place in themselves and in the revolutionary leaders as the former perceive the dedication and authenticity of the latter. The trust of the people in the leaders reflects the confidence of the leaders in the people. This confidence should not, however, be naive. The leaders must believe in the potentialities of the people, whom they cannot treat as mere objects of their own action, they must believe that the people are capable of participating in the pursuit of liberation. But they must always mistrust the ambiguity of oppressed people, mistrust the oppressor housed in the latter. Accordingly, when Guevara exhorts the revolutionary to always be mistrustful, he is not disregarding the fundamental condition of the theory of dialogical action. He is merely being a realist. Note 44, Guevara to El Patojo, a young Guatemalan leaving Cuba to engage in guerrilla activity in his own country. Mistrust. At the beginning, do not trust your own shadow. Never trust friendly peasants, informers, guides, or contact men. Do not trust anything or anybody until a zone is completely liberated. That's from Episodes of the Revolutionary War, page 102. He is merely being a realist. Although trust is basic to dialogue, it is not an a priori condition of the latter. It results from the encounter in which persons are co-subjects in denouncing the world as part of the world's transformation. What's up, Julian? But as long as the oppressor within the oppressed is stronger than they themselves are, their natural fear of freedom may lead them to denounce the revolutionary leaders instead. The leaders cannot be credulous, but must be alert for these possibilities. Guevara's episodes confirms these risks, not only desertions, but even betrayal of the cause. Nice. At times, not nice to the text, but nice to Julian. At times in this document, while recognizing the necessity of punishing the deserter in order to preserve the cohesion and discipline of the group, Guevara also recognizes certain factors which explain the desertion. One of them, perhaps the most important, is the deserter's ambiguity. Another portion of Guevara's document, which refers to his presence not only as a guerrilla but as a medical doctor, in the peasants' community in the Sierra, Maestra, uh, the Sierra Maestra, and relates to our discussion of cooperation, is quite striking. 
As a result of daily contact with these people and their problems, we became firmly convinced of the need for a complete change in the life of our people. The idea of an agrarian, uh, the idea of an agrarian reform became crystal clear. Communion with the people ceased to be a mere theory, to become an integral part of ourselves. Guerrillas and peasants began to merge into a solid mass. No one can say exactly when, in this long process, the ideas became reality and be became a part of the peasantry. As far as I am concerned, the contact with my patients in the Sierra turned a spontaneous and somewhat lyrical decision into a more serene force, one of an entirely different value. Those poor, suffering, loyal inhabitants of the Sierra cannot even imagine what a great contribution they made to the forging of our revolutionary ideology. Note 45, emphasis added. Note Guevara's emphasis that communion with the people was decisive for the transformation of a spontaneous and somewhat lyrical decision into a more serene force, one of an entirely different value. It was then, in dialogue with the peasants, that Guevara's revolutionary praxis became definitive. What Guevara did not say, perhaps due to humility, is that it was his own humility and capacity to love that made possible his communion with the people. And this indisputably dialogical communion became cooperation. Note that Guevara who did not climb the Sierra, Ma uh, the Sierra Maestra with Fidel and his comrades as a frustrated youth in search of adventure, recognizes that his communion with the people ceased to be a mere theory to become an integral part of himself. He stresses how from the moment of that communion, the peasants became foragers of his guerrillas' revolutionary ideology. Even Guevara's unmistakable style of narrating his and his comrades' experiences, of describing his contacts with the poor, loyal peasants in almost evangelical language, reveals this remarkable man's deep capacity for love and communication. Thence emerges the force of his ardent testimony to the work of another loving man, Camilo Torres, the guerrilla priest. Without the communion with engenders, which engenders true cooperation, the Cuban people would have been mere objects of the revolutionary activity of the Sierra Maestra, and as objects, their adherence would have been impossible. At the most, there might have been adhesion, but that is a component of domination, not revolution. In dialogical theory, at no stage can revolutionary action forego communion with the people. Communion, in turn, elicits cooperation, which brings leaders and people to the fusion described by Guevara. This fusion can exist only if revolutionary action is really human, empathetic, loving, communicative, and humble in order to be liberating. The revolution loves and creates life, and in order to create life, it may be obliged to prevent some men from circumscribing life. In addition to the life-death cycle basic to nature, there is almost an unnatural living death, life which is denied its fullness. Note 46, with regard to man's defenses against his own death following the death of God in current thought, see Michael Dufresne Poulon. It should not be necessary here to cite statistics to show how many Brazilians and Latin Americans in general are living corpses, shadows of human beings, hopeless men, women, and children victimized by an endless, invisible war in which their remnants of life are devoured by tuberculosis, schistosomiasis, infant diarrhea, by the myriad diseases of poverty, most of which, in the terminology of the oppressors, are called tropical diseases. Note 47. First burp. Excuse me. Many peasants sell themselves or members of their families into slavery to escape starvation. One Belo Horizonte newspaper discovered as many as 50,000 victims sold for $1,500,000. 
and one reporter, to prove it, bought a man and his wife for thirty dollars. I have seen many a good man starve, explained the slave. That is why I did not mind being sold. When one slave dealer was arrested in São Paulo in 1959, he admitted having contacts with São Paulo ranchers, coffee plantations, and construction projects for his commodity, except teenage girls who were sold to brothels. John Garassi, The Great Fear. Father Chenu makes the following comments regarding possible, possible reactions to situations as extreme as the above. Many, both among the priests attending the council and the informed laymen, fear that in facing the needs and suffering of the world, we may simply adopt an emotional protest in favor of palliating the manifestations and symptoms of poverty and injustice without going on to analyze the causes of the latter to denounce a regime which encompasses this injustice and engenders this poverty. Note 48. M. D. Chenu, témoignage chrétien, as cited by André Moine and Cristianos y Marxistas después del Concilio. Page 167. Unity, new section. Unity for liberation. Whereas in the anti-dialogical theory of action, the dominators are compelled by necessity to divide the oppressed, the more easily to preserve the state of oppression, in the dialogical theory, the leaders must dedicate themselves to an untiring effort for unity among the oppressed, and unity of the leaders with the oppressed, in order to achieve liberation. The difficulty is that this category of dialogical action, like the others, cannot occur apart from the praxis. The praxis of oppression is easy, or at least not difficult, for the dominant elite, but it is not easy for the revolutionary leaders to carry out a liberating praxis. It's not easy, remember that. The former group can rely on using the instruments of power, the latter group has this power directed against it. The former group can organize itself freely, and though it may undergo fortuitous and momentary divisions, it unites rapidly in the face of any threats to its fundamental interests. The latter group cannot exist without the people, and this very condition constitutes the first obstacle to its efforts at organization. It would indeed be inconsistent of the dominant elite to allow the revolutionary leaders to organize. The internal unity of the dominant elite, which reinforces and organizes its power, requires that the people be divided. The unity of the revolutionary leaders only exists in the unity of the people among themselves and in turn with them. The unity of the elite derives from its antagonism with the people. The unity of the revolutionary leadership group grows out of communion with the united people. The concrete situation of oppression, which dualizes the eye of the oppressed. Sorry, I'm just like stretching my neck a little bit. <clears throat> The concrete situation of oppression, which dualizes the I of the oppressed, thereby making the oppressed person ambiguous, emotionally unstable, and fearful of freedom, facilitates the divisive action of the dominator by hindering the unifying action indispensable to liberation. So, you know, this is a sort of another way to sort of refer to the ways, in my interpretation, that people house their own worst enemies, essentially. They house the oppressor within themselves, and so that antagonism is kind of a natural part of their life, and also, excuse me, that antagonism makes them fearful of freedom because being you know, free means cutting off that part of yourself, right? Or being emotionally unstable, right? Because it's like you have these two dual elements in yourself that are combating Right, And one of those elements is trying to repress you, trying to dehumanize you, trying to exploit you. 
Further, domination is itself objectively divisive. It maintains the oppressed I in a position of adhesion to a reality which seems all-powerful and overwhelming, and then alienates by presenting mysterious forces to explain this power. Part of the oppressed I is located in the reality to which it adheres. In quotes. Adheres in quotes. Part is located outside the self, in the mysterious forces which are regarded as responsible for a reality about which nothing can be done. The individual is divided between an identical past and present, and a future without hope. He or she is a person who does not perceive himself or herself as becoming, hence cannot have a future to be built in unity with others. But... As he or she breaks this adhesion and objectifies the reality from which he or she starts to emerge, the person begins to integrate as a subject, an I, confronting an object, reality. At this moment, sundering the false unity of the divided self, one becomes a true individual. To divide the oppressed, an ideology of oppression is indispensable. In contrast, Achieving their unity requires a form of cultural action through which they come to know the why and how of their adhesion to reality. It requires de-ideologizing. Hence, the effort to unify the oppressed does not call for mere ideological sloganizing, the latter by distorting the authentic relation between the subject and objective reality also separates the cognitive, the affective, and the active aspects of the total, indivisible personality. I think what's meant by sloganizing, and he's mentioned this a lot, is like the thing you can't do, the thing that's not a part of real radical education, um, liberatory education, is just like the making of slogans, the making of like cheap, small little ways to memorize or understand, you know, concepts. Um, Everything becomes like a slogan. Everything becomes a mantra. Everything becomes like a little song. Um, and that's like, there's not, it's not like there's not a place for catchphrases or songs, but the force becomes put behind those things rather than the actual active work of critically thinking. You don't have to critically think. You have the slogan to do the, to do the thought for you, you know? The object of dialogical libertarian action is not to dislodge the oppressed from a mythological reality in order to bind them to another reality. On the contrary, the object of dialogical action is to make it possible for the oppressed, by perceiving their adhesion, to opt to transform an unjust reality. Since the unity of the oppressed involves solidarity among them, regardless of their exact status, this unity unquestionably requires class consciousness. However, the submersion in reality which characterizes the peasants of Latin America means that consciousness of being an oppressed class must be preceded, or at least accompanied, by achieving consciousness of being oppressed individuals. Note 49. For someone to achieve critical consciousness of his status as an oppressed man requires recognition of his reality as an oppressive reality. For this reason, it requires reaching the compréhension du le sens de la société, which is for Lukács, une facture de puissance de tout premier ordre. ordre. Pourquoi, sorry, pourquoi ce même sang douce l'âme pour et simplement divisive? George Lukács, Histoire et conscience de classe, page 93. No idea. I mean, I'm not quite sure what that means. I think I kind of understood it, but for those of you who understand French, feel free to offer a translation. <laughs> I'm sorry for the what you're going through. I'll have the Zuckerberger. Um, you want to buy my merchandise? I don't have any currently. Um, and don't worry about it if you're homeless. Focus on using your money for yourself. Proposing as a problem to a European peasant the fact that he or she is a person might strike them as strange. This is not true of Latin American peasants, whose world usually ends at the boundaries of the latifundium. The latifundium, why did I say it like that? The latifundium, whose gestures to some extent simulate those of the animals and the trees, and who often consider themselves equal to the latter. 
men who are bound to nature and to the oppressor in this way must come to discern themselves as persons prevented from being. And discovering themselves means, in the first instance, discovering themselves as Pedro, as Antonio, or, or as Josefa. This discovery implies a different perception of the meaning of designations. The words world, men, culture, tree, work, animal, reassume their true significance. The peasants now see themselves as transformers of reality, previously a mysterious entity, through their creative labor. They discover that, as people, they can no longer continue to be things possessed by others, and they can move from consciousness of themselves as oppressed individuals to the consciousness of an oppressed class. Any attempt to unify the peasants based on activist methods which rely on slogans and do not deal with these fundamental aspects produces a mere juxtaposition of individuals, giving a purely mechanistic character to their action. The unity of the oppressed occurs at the human level, not at the level of things. It occurs in a reality which is only authentically comprehended in the dialectic between the sub and superstructure. In order for the oppressed to unite, they must first cut the umbilical cord of magic and myth which binds them to the world of oppression. The unity which links them to each other must be of a different nature. To achieve this indispensable unity, the revolutionary process must be, from the beginning, cultural action. The methods used to achieve the unity of the oppressed will depend on the latter's historical and existential experience within the social structure. Peasants lived in a closed reality with a single compact center of oppressive, oppressive decision. The urban oppressed live in an expanding context in which the oppressive command center is plural and complex. Peasants are under the control of a dominant figure who incarnates the oppressive system. In urban areas, the oppressed are subjugated to an oppressive impersonality. In both cases, the oppressive power is to a certain extent invisible in the rural zone because of its proximity to the oppressed, in the cities because of its dispersion. So you see what he means there, right? The person who is oppressed rurally are oppressed in this kind of simple way that can be incarnated by a person or group of people, but that they'll never come into contact with because of pure proximity, pure distance, as well as, you know, matters of force. Whereas in the urban setting, in the city, in New York City, in Maryland, in Paris, in, in you know, London, in Bangkok, it's dispersed everywhere, that oppressive reality. It's dispersed in all these different relations. Uh, and oppressive impersonality is the term used. So both ways make it invisible for each context, right? And that's invisible with quotes around it, more or less invisible. Forms of cultural action in such different situations as these have nonetheless the same objective. Excuse me. Forms of cultural action in such different situations as these have nonetheless the same objective. To clarify to the oppressed the objective situation which binds them to the oppressors, visible or not, only forms of action which avoid mere speech-making and ineffective blah on the one hand and mechanistic activism on the other can also oppose the divisive action of the dominant elites and move towards the unity of the oppressed. New section, organization. In the theory of anti-dialogical action, manipulation is indispensable to conquest and domination. In the dialogical theory of action, the organization of the people presents the antagonistic opposite of this manipulation. Organization is not only directly linked to unity, but is a natural development of that unity. Accordingly, the leaders' pursuit of unity is necessarily also an attempt to organize the people, requiring witness to the fact that the struggle for liberation is a common task. This constant, humble, and courageous witness emerging from cooperation in a shared effort, the liberation of women and men, 
avoids the danger of anti-dialogical control. The form of witness may vary depending on the historical conditions of any society. Witness itself, however, is an indispensable element of revolutionary action. Witness, right? This idea of witness. Bearing witness, maybe, is a phrase that you can understand it by. Witnessing could be things that branch from that idea. In order to determine the what and how of that witness, it is therefore essential to have an increasingly critical knowledge of the current historical context, the view of the world held by the people, the principal contradiction of society, and the principal aspect of that contradiction. Since these dimensions of witness are historical, dialogical, and therefore dialectical, witness cannot simply import them from other contexts without previously analyzing its own. To do otherwise is to absolutize and to mythologize the relative. Alienation then becomes unavoidable. Witness in the dialogical theory of action is one of the principal expressions of the cultural and educational character of the revolution. The essential elements of witness, which do not vary historically, include consistency between words and actions, boldness, which urges the witnesses to confront existence at a as a permanent risk, radicalization, not sectarianism, leading, to both, leading both the witnesses and the ones receiving that witness to increasing action, courage to love, which, far from being accommodation to an unjust world, is rather the transformation of that world in behalf of the increasing liberation of, man, of humankind, and faith in the people, since it is to them that witness is made, although witness to the people, because of their dialectical relations with the dominant elites, also affects the latter, who respond to that witness in their customary way. All authentic, that is, critical, witness involves the daring to run risks, including the possibility that the leaders will not always win the immediate adherence of the people. Witness, which has not borne fruit at a certain moment and under certain conditions, is not thereby rendered incapable of bearing fruit tomorrow. Since witness is not an ab excuse me, since witness is not an abstract gesture but an action, a confrontation with the world and with people, it is not static. Witness is not static. It is a dynamic element which becomes part of the societal context in which it occurred. From that moment, it does not cease to affect that context. In anti-dialogical action, manipulation anesthetizes the people and facilitates their domination. In dialogical action, manipulation is superseded by authentic organization. In anti-dialogical action, manipulation serves the ends of conquest. In dialogical action, daring and loving witness serve the ends of organization. For the dominant elites, organization means organizing themselves. For the revolutionary leaders, organization means organizing themselves with the people. In the first event, the dominant elite increasingly structures its power so that it can more efficiently dominate and depersonalize. In the second, organization only corresponds to its nature and objective, if in itself it constitutes the practice of freedom. Accordingly, the discipline necessary to any organization must not be confused with regimentation. It is quite true that without leadership, discipline, determination, and objectives, Without tasks to fulfill and accounts to be rendered, an organization cannot survive, and revolutionary action is thereby diluted. This fact, however, can never justify treating the people as things to be used. The people are already depersonalized by oppression. If the revolutionary leaders manipulate them, instead of working towards their conscientisation, the very objective of organization, that is, liberation, is thereby negated. I missed note 50, I think. Note 50 was a bit earlier after um, 
it is a is it a <laughs> it is a dynamic element which becomes part of the societal context in which it occurred. From that moment, it does not cease to affect that context. And note fifty says, regarded as process, authentic witness which does not bear immediate fruit cannot be judged an absolute failure. The men who butchered Tiradinch could quarter his body, but they could not erase his witness. Kind of speaks to what witness is like really is aside from like you seeing something or being witness to something and having a memory of it it is the sort of transformatory transformative power of that witness with a critical consciousness and you know acting based on it as well dr um let me actually okay Organizing the people is the process in which the revolutionary leaders, who are also preventing from saying their own word, initiate the experience of learning how to name the world. So, note 51, Dr. Orlando Aguirre Ortiz, director of a medical school at a Cuban university, once told me the revolution involves three Ps, palabra, uh, palabra povo, e polvora. That's word, people, and gunpowder. The explosion of the gunpowder clears the people's perception of their concrete situation in pursuit through action of their liberation. There you go, liberation. It was interesting to observe how this revolutionary physician stressed the word in the sense that it has been used in this essay as action and reflection, as praxis. This is true learning experience and therefore dialogical. So it is that the leaders cannot say their word alone. They must say it with the people. Leaders who do not act dialogically, but insist on imposing their decisions, do not organize the people. They manipulate them. They do not liberate, for, nor are they liberated. They oppress. And so that's the difference. Even if you act in a way as a leader, some type of political leader that's like this is going to benefit the people so they should just trust me on this right the fact that it emerges from you and that it should then be cast down upon the people means that it's just still going to be oppression ultimately because it's still manipulative you know it's, it forces them to rely on you even if it's for something helpful um and does not give them agency in politics agency in their political reality you know <laughs> the fact that the leaders who organize the people do not have the right to arbitrarily impose their word does not mean that they must therefore take a liberalist position which would encourage license among the people who are accustomed to oppression. The dialogical theory of action, sorry for the creaky chair. The dialogical theory of action opposes both authoritarianism and license and thereby affirms authority and freedom. There is no freedom without authority, but there is also no authority without freedom. Great quote. All freedom contains the possibility that under special circumstances and at different existential levels, it may become authority. Freedom and authority cannot be isolated, but must be considered in relationship to each other. Note 52, this relationship will be conflictive if the objective situation is one of oppression or of license. Authentic authority is not affirmed as such by a mere transfer of power, but through delegation or in sympathetic adherence. If authority is merely transferred from one group to another or is imposed upon the majority, it degenerates into authoritarianism. Authority can avoid conflict with freedom only if it is freedom become authority. Hypertrophy of the one provokes atrophy of the other. I like that, that concept, um, that sort of wording of a dialectical relationship, right? Just as authority cannot exist without freedom and vice versa, authoritarianism, authoritarianism cannot exist without denying freedom nor license without denying authority. 
in the theory of dialogical action, organization requires authority, so it cannot be authoritarian. It requires freedom, so it cannot be licentious. Organization is, rather, a highly educational process. Excuse me. Hey, Debbie. A highly educational process in which leaders and people together experience true authority and freedom. Excuse me. Which they then seek to establish in society by transforming the reality which mediates them. Cultural synthesis. Remember how there was cultural invasion on the anti dialogic side, for those of you who are paying attention or remember? This is cultural synthesis on the dialogic side. The good thing, not the bad thing. Cultural synthesis. Cultural action is always a systematic and deliberate form of action which operates upon the social structure, either with the objective of preserving that structure or of transforming it. As a form of deliberate and systematic action, all cultural action has its theory which determines its ends and thereby defines its methods. Cultural action either serves domination, consciously or unconsciously, or it serves the liberation of men and women. As these dialectically opposed types of cultural action operate in and upon the social structure, they create dialectical relations of permanence and change. The social structure, in order to be, must become. In other words, becoming is the way the social structure expresses duration, in the Bergsonian sense of the term. Note 53, what makes a structure a social structure, and thus historical cultural, is neither permanence nor change, taken absolutely, but the dialectical relations between the two. In the last analysis, what endures in the social structure is neither permanence nor change, it is the permanence change dialectic itself. Dialogical cultural action does not have as its aim the disappearance of the permanence change dialectic, an impossible aim, since disappearance of the dialectic would require the disappearance of the social structure itself and thus of men. It aims, rather, at surmounting the antagonistic contradictions of the social structure, thereby achieving the liberation of human beings. Anti-dialogical cultural action, on the other hand, aims at mythicizing such contradictions, thereby hoping to avoid or hinder in so far as possible the radical transformation of reality. Anti-dialogical action explicitly or implicitly aims to preserve within the social structure situations which favor its own agents. While the latter would never accept a transformation of the structure sufficiently radical to overcome its antagonistic contradictions, they may accept reforms which do not affect their power of decision over the oppressed. Hence, this modality of action involves the conquest of the people, their division, their manipulation, and cultural invasion. It is necessarily and fundamentally an induced action. Dialogical action, however, is characterized by the supersedence of any induced aspect. The incapacity of anti-dialogical cultural action to supersede its induced character results from its objective, domination. The capacity of dialogical cultural action to do this lies in its objective, liberation. So, again, the difference in anti-dialogical and dialogical. Anti-dialogical cultural action is for domination. Dialogical cultural action is for liberation. In cultural invasion, the actors draw the thematic content of their action from their own values and ideology. Their starting point is their own world, from which they enter the world of those they invade. In cultural synthesis, the actors who come from another world to the world of the people do so not as invaders. They do not come to teach or transmit or to give anything but rather to learn with the people about the people's world. In cultural invasion, both the spectators and the reality to be preserved are objects of the actors' action. In cultural synthesis, there are no spectators. The object of the actors' action is the reality 
to be transformed for the liberation of man. Cultural synthesis is thus a mode of action for confronting culture itself, as the preserver of the very structures by which it was formed. Cultural action, as historical action, is an instrument for superseding the dominant alienated and alienating culture. You should watch Andrewism's video about culture. In this sense, every authentic revolution is a cultural revolution. We're winding down, folks. The investigation of the people's generative themes or meaningful thematics described in chapter 3 constitutes the starting point for the process of action as a cultural synthesis. Uh, indeed, it is not really possible to divide this process into separate steps. First, thematic investigation, and then action as cultural synthesis. Such a dichotomy would, not, would imply an initial phase in which the people, as passive objects, would be studied, analyzed, and investigated by the investigators, a procedure congruent with anti-dialogical action. Such division would lead to the naive conclusion that action as synthesis follows from action as invasion. So this is the distinguishment between this idea, for instance, like you see in a movie where people do like an espionage thing or some type of like investigation thing before they try to ingratiate themselves into a group or use that group for their purposes. Note that distinction. You'll see these scenes, you know, where it's like they go in, they, they're in you know, costume and they're observing the ways of the people and they're observing different things and like taking things down, noting things. And then they go in and using that knowledge do what they want to do, like achieve whatever they want to achieve. And oftentimes those goals we're taught in movies are good things that are achieved. But a lot of the times they're not, even at that point. And in reality, that's not the way that it's supposed to work. Doing that, doing it that way, is inherently culturally invasive. It separates the idea of investigation from the idea of, you know, um, um, what's the other term? Um, action, really. Thematic investigation and then action as cultural synthesis. Those are not two, you know, you do first the one, then the other. They have to be part of each other. Again, a lot of the points that Freddy makes are that stop thinking about things as segmented. Stop thinking about first we'll do this and then we'll have this. Think about it more so as you're just constantly in a process. Stop looking for ends and start looking for cont continuous improvement of the process. Right, So that even this idea of the ends justify the means is a flawed, fatalistic, determinative, deterministic, you know, and oppressive idea in a lot of ways. Because ultimately, the ends are not really things, especially when it comes to politics. You don't really have ends. What you have is continuous products, continuous processes that produce certain things which come and go. And the goal should be to change that process, not just to change the end result. Because ultimately, the end result won't change because it's still going to come from the same process. You see what I mean? In dialogical theory, this division cannot occur. The subjects of thematic investigation are not, the only, prof are not only the professional investigators, but also the men and women of the people whose thematic universe is being sought. You can see that he writes about that in chapter 3 as well. Investigation, the first moment of action as cultural synthesis, establishes a climate of creativity which will tend to develop in the subsequent stages of action. This is all helpful for me to think about YouTube video ideas as well. Such a climate does not exist in cultural invasion, which through alienation kills the creative enthusiasm of those who are invaded, leaving them hopeless and fearful of risking experimentation, without which there is no true creativity. Those who are invaded, whatever their level, rarely go beyond the models which the invaders prescribe for them. In cultural synthesis, there are no invaders, hence there are no imposed models. In their stead, there are actors who critically analyze reality, never separating this analysis from action, and intervene as subjects in the historical process. 
instead of following predetermined plans, leaders, and people, mutually identified, together create the guidelines. Let me reread that. Instead of following predetermined plans, leaders and people, mutually identified, together create the guidelines of their action. In this synthesis, leaders and people are somehow reborn in new knowledge and new action. Knowledge of the alienated culture leads to transforming action resulting in a culture which is being freed from alienation. The more sophisticated knowledge of the leaders is remade in the empirical knowledge of the people, while the latter is refined by the former. In cultural synthesis, and only in cultural synthesis, it is possible to resolve the contradiction between the worldview of the leaders and that of the people, to the enrichment of both. Cultural synthesis does not deny the differences between the two views. Indeed, it is based on these differences. It does deny the invasion of one by the other, but affirms the undeniable support each gives to the other. See you, AA. Revolutionary leaders must avoid organizing themselves apart from the people. Whatever contradiction to the people may occur fortuitously due to certain historical conditions must be solved, not augmented by the cultural invasion of an imposed relationship. Cultural synthesis is the only way. Revolutionary leaders commit many errors and miscalculations by not taking into account something so real as the people's view of the world a view which explicitly and implicitly contains their concerns, their doubts, their hopes, their way of seeing the leaders, their perceptions of themselves and of the oppressors, their religious beliefs, almost always syncretic, their fatalism, their rebellious reactions. None of these elements can be seen separately, for in interaction, all of them compose a totality. The oppressor is interested in knowing this totality, I deny only as an aid to his action of invasion in order to dominate or preserve domination. For the revolutionary leaders, the knowledge of this totality is indispensable to their action as cultural synthesis. Cultural synthesis, precisely because it is a synthesis, does not mean that the objectives of revolutionary action should be limited by the aspirations expressed in the worldview of the people. If this were to happen, in the guise of respect for that view, the revolutionary leaders would be passively bound to that vision. Neither invasion by the leaders of the people's worldview, nor mere adaptation by the leaders to the often naive aspirations of the people, is acceptable. To be concrete, if at a given historical moment the basic aspiration of the people goes no further than a demand for salary increases, the leaders can commit one of two errors. They can limit their action to stimulating this one demand, or they can overrule this popular aspiration and substitute something more far-reaching, but something which has not yet come to the forefront of the people's attention. Note 54, Lenin severely attacked the tendency of the Russian Social Democratic Party to emphasize economic demands of the proletariat as an instrument of the revolutionary struggle, a practice he termed economic spontaneity. What is to be done in On Politics and Revolution Selected Writings. In the first case, the revolutionary leaders follow a line of adaptation to the people's demands. In the second case, by disrespecting the aspirations of the people, they fall into cultural invasion. The solution lies in synthesis. Synthesis! The leaders must on the one hand identify with the people's demand for higher salaries, while on the other, they must pose the meaning of that very demand as a problem. You see what problem posing education is? You see how deep that, you know, this is what we mean, right? Like you teach a class, imagine you teach a class and you're trying to show these kids that like they should be thinking critically. You're trying to have the kids develop a critical consciousness of politics and stuff like that. Most of us just opt to like put them in sort of fake vanguard training circles and be like, 
memorize these terms, you know, try to tell them things about themselves, try to tell them things about their world, and that never works. And then we get frustrated and we think that they're stupid and that just reifies the myth of the ignorant people. But what you can do is ask the kids, what are they thinking about? What are the problems in their world, right? What do they want? And then they can tell you, well, I just want, a, guy, a boy can tell you, I want to get more attention from girls, right? A heterosexual boy might tell you that. And then you can take that and pose as a problem. Pose as a problem that central want. You know, not just, okay, I'll teach you to do that so that you can get more attention from girls, but also not just, hey, what you want is stupid. But instead you say, okay, well, why do you want more attention from girls? You know, even in the earliest, the easiest way, why do you want that? And they explain that and you ask why, where did that come from? You know, you can do that. <laughs> you know, this is one example of problem posing education. Take what they are thinking and what they want and then pose a problem to them for them to think about deeper that will help them ostensibly to reach what they want, but also help them to grasp deeper things about reality. Muchas gracias, Lorena. Que pasa un buen día. By doing this, the leaders pose as a problem, a real, concrete, historical situation of which the salary demand is one dimension. It will thereby become clear that salary demands alone cannot comprise a definitive solution. The essence of this solution can be found in the previously cited statement by bishops of the third world that if the workers do not somehow come to be owners of their own labor, all structural reforms will be ineffective. They must be owners, not sellers of their labor, for any purchase or sale of labor is a type of slavery. To achieve critical consciousness of the facts that it is necessary to be the owner of one's own labor, that labor constitutes part of the human person, and that a human being can neither be sold nor can he sell himself, is to go a step beyond the deception of palliative solutions. It is to engage in authentic transformation of reality in order by humanizing that reality to humanize women and men. In the anti-dialogical theory of action, cultural invasion serves the ends of manipulation, which in turn serves the ends of conquest, and conquest the ends of domination. Cultural synthesis serves the ends of organization, Organization serves the ends of liberation. This work deals with a very obvious truth. Just as the oppressor, in order to oppress, needs a theory of oppressive action, so the oppressed, in order to become free, also need a theory of action. The oppressor elaborates his theory of action without the people, for he stands against them. Nor can the people as long as they are crushed and oppressed, internalizing the image of the oppressor, construct by themselves the theory of their liberating action. Only in the encounter of the people with the revolutionary leaders, in their communion, in their praxis, can this theory be built. And that's the end of the book. All right, Julian, no problem. That's the end of the book. So, thoughts? <laughs> So for me, this is, you know, like I've said, this is my favorite book of all time. And just as some closing thoughts, um, for one, let me know if you have thoughts that you want to share or questions. But for me, what I'll just say is that for one, the idea of problem posing education, I think, is something we can all take into our attempts at doing, for instance, as YouTubers, this edutainment stuff, this video making. Yeah, that's the end, Carol. We did it indeed. Um or just in general, as educators, as teachers, as people who want to help others. I mean, one of the central things that commenters will talk about that so much of this stuff we talk about on this channel, oppression, 
um, you know, exploitation, capitalism, colonialism, all that good shit or bad shit, you know, is digested and discussed through the process of discussions with people in your life. That is the main thing. That is people's main encounter with these conversations, right? That's the main way that we, you know, even figure that these conversations show up in our lives, which I think is something we can work on because when we dig deeper, we realize how much these things show up in every part of our life. With that said, this is a great book for understanding how to go about those conversations because it helps you to avoid the patterns that will make a person run away from you. It helps you to understand what, how much you can do and how much you can just kind of not do and should not be trying to do in terms of trying to change a person's thought, for instance, or trying to liberate a person, but instead gives you the tools to understand, for one, how that person can help liberate you and how you can help liberate them. So as Thalen says, blending the boundaries of teacher and student because we can all learn from each other. This book does a great job of actualizing and theorizing what that really means in a, in a realm of what the world and what life is really about, which is trying to transform this world for the better. So I have many thoughts on this book, but I would love to see your comments about it in the uploaded version. Again, on Reading with Elliot, this channel, I will upload this full stream. Would love to see your comments on there. Would love to see your comments in the community posts. Lycos, as an activist, I love, love, love using problem posing method, but the biggest problem with using it is that we need a lot of time and quiet focusing space to have those deep, long conversations. Most people just can't find that space. I think that is very, very true. You know, remember that Freire is, you know, describing these processes of doing problem posing education in these circles, these educational circles, these teaching circles. And that requires a lot of resources in the first place, a lot of the times. So we have to be thinking about how to do this more and more with what we got. I think that there's a really important point to take away. And um, yeah, uh, we'd love to see your comments. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you for bearing my readings, my burping, my <laughs> stumbling, my um, poor explanations at times, all that stuff. I'm doing my best and I enjoy doing this with y'all. I will help. To, I will put up a poll soon for the next book that we can read live and see what y'all want. But I'm glad we started here. And that's it. Take care. Have a great day.